Sponsored by the new Opera desktop browser. This train is unlike anything you have ever seen before. It never needs to stop and it never needs to refuel. Why? Because it's nuclear powered. The Atomic Age promised a Jetsons world of limitless power, everything from airships to aircraft, and yes, even nuclear trains themselves. But railways across the globe never adopted nuclear trains, and our age of greener, non stop service came to a sudden halt. All aboard Thomas the Nuclear Engine, the Atomic Locomotive X 12. The X-12 was 360 tons and impressively long, so long that it would have a pivot in the middle of the locomotive to go around corners. The engine bed would be comprised of 24 driving wheels grouped in six wheel trucks. There would be a driver cabin at the front, a reactor in the middle, and at the rear, the vast radiator array. But I'm getting ahead of myself. How would that all work and what was inside? Starting from the front, we have the driver's cabin. There was an engineer who would control the train and a fireman. Now I know what you're thinking, a fireman? He doesn't actually insert coal, but would be a nuclear engineer to help manage the reactor, which is definitely a slight step up from a man with a shovel. And speaking of reactor, behind them was the reactor compartment. The nuclear power source would have been a solution of fissionable material such as uranium-235, contained in a tank three feet long and a foot in diameter. This would, in turn, would have been enclosed within a 20-ton shield. It would be supported by trusses on either side to hold the heavy shielding in place with the core of the reactor in the middle. 10,000 litres of water would pass through the boiler, over the reactive rods, and then be turned into steam. This steam would then move into the turbine, which would be connected to four generators, which would power 600 horsepower traction motors to drive each axle. So yes, technically it was a steam train, but it was nuclear powered rather than coal powered. The steam would then enter a condenser and then be cooled by a vast radiation array that was at the end of the locomotive. This would blow air from the outside over the water lines before the now cold liquid water would be sent back to the reactor. The reactor itself would actually weigh 200 tons with the majority of the weight going to the shielding. But we'll have a talk about that in a moment. But because of this radiation, presumably this train would have only been used for freight service and not passenger travel. And this was to do more with logistics. Passenger trains back in this era of America, which was more popular than air travel, had regular stops to load and unload passengers, giving them plenty of time to refuel. Cargo, on the other hand, would need to run overnight across the country and cargo operators could save a fortune by never stopping making limitless fuel a very exciting indeed. This whole machine, whilst heavy, was compact and highly efficient for the time, able to reach up to about 9,000 to 12,000 horsepower when overloading the reactor. And to put that into perspective, the X-12 would be so powerful that it would be able to accelerate a 5,000 ton train from standing to 60 miles per hour in just three and a half minutes. That's pretty damn fast. The engineers believe that this could push out the equivalent of diesel engines at the time, which is impressive that most of the power went to move the locomotive itself. The engineers figured it would cost around about $1.2 million to build the X-12, which was about twice the cost of a comparable four-unit diesel locomotive in the 1950s. Believing that uranium-235 could be attained for around about $9,000 a pound and run for a full year between refuelings, they thought that this locomotive would be able to compete successfully with diesel power under favourable circumstances. With the engineering problem solved and a pretty compelling business case, it was time to take this to the locomotive industry. But you can bet that it wasn't just the Americans working on this technology, but our favorite Cold War opponents, the Soviet Union. 
Nuclear trains seem like the next evolution of our rail networks. And talking about them today, it makes me realize that maybe it's time to upgrade everything else in my life. And there's no better place to start than getting a better free web browser like Opera. I've totally switched to Opera as my preferred web browser because too many times my computer slowed down with other browsers hogging up all the computer space and crashing. Or worse, the other day it didn't even launch. And I thought there has to be something better. And Opera it is. It's safer, it doesn't cost anything, and it has built-in ad blocking and VPNs, but it's also smarter with actual useful features. For example, I love the tab islands. This tab grouping is much more powerful than just putting groups for work or fun, but also when you're looking at, say for example, hotels. You open up 10 at once and you can keep your feed clean and still find the other tabs without having to close them all. It's simple and intuitive and just makes sense. Plus, Opera has its own AI called Aria. In partnership with ChatGPT, it actually makes my web experience a lot faster, allowing me to instantly translate a page, great for when I'm looking at top secret Soviet projects, or I can ask it to explain briefly, which is also great for when I'm trying to understand the science between anti-gravity technology. And lastly, it's just got like everything in it. I can open up several different music players, all of my messaging apps, without having them take up room on the desktop. It's just better. Honestly, the Opera desktop browser is the refreshing game changer that we need for our computers and something that I do honestly recommend. It's amazing that they've partnered up with us to help make the channel better and give you a free great product, just to make the internet a better place. So help out the channel by trying Opera out for free with the link down in the description. And honestly, you won't regret it or I'll give you a full refund. It goes without saying that the other side of the Iron Curtain heard about these developments and had to have their own attempt at nuclear powered trains. At the time, the Soviet Union was massive and creating wide track trains with a large capacity was imperative in their large projects of conquering Siberia. In 1956, a publication in a Soviet magazine described the power of the atom was being used to conquer the cold and distant Far East. The Soviet atomic train would use a nuclear reactor to heat the water in a steam turbine to create electricity, which would then power the engines and the locomotive. Basically a very similar concept to the American one. However, they believed that liquid sodium was the optimal choice to be used as the coolant for the reactor, and they projected that their concept could generate around five and a half thousand horsepower, slightly less than the X-12. But this is where it gets interesting. The Soviet track gauge was already wider than the Europeans, but this atomic train would operate on a 2.5 to 3 times wider track because of the sheer size of the locomotives. All the passenger cars were also designed with two decks and it would be able to carry an insane amount of cargo or construction materials towards Siberia with ore, oil and gas in the other direction. Of course, the military applications of this train would also be very important as well, allowing the Soviet army to transfer huge amounts of personnel in vehicles over great distances very fast. The idea would linger for decades without any concrete development until the 1980s when Chernobyl put it on brakes. The Chernobyl disaster made it seem that a radioactive train would be a terrible idea and the Soviet Union backed away from the concept. But surprisingly, all this nuclear innovation was from an unexpected other type of vehicle, submarines. In the 1950s, nuclear power opened the door for all sorts of atomic propulsion breakthroughs for the Navy. Everything was on the table from aircraft carriers to merchant Navy vessels, but it was submarines that took the cake. Submarines, by their very nature, had to lurk beneath the waves and never stop moving. The Germans and the Japanese had learned this the hard way that when a submarine had to refuel, it was at its most vulnerable. Thus, a power source that never needed to be refueled, or refueled incredibly rarely, was preferred. Submarines were also the perfect testbed for the technology. They were large machines that were surrounded by water, away from, well, 
everyone, a safe testing ground for nuclear reactors. Plus, the military, with their unlimited budget, was more than happy to experiment and get the fundamentals down, ready for civil applications like trains. Trains being large machines like submarines, operating mostly away from population centers, at least for the freighter goods variety of locomotive, and always required to stop and refuel, were the perfect subject for nuclear upgrades. So if submarines were so successful with nuclear energy, why didn't subjectively similar trains follow? We're over 8 minutes into the video and I haven't yet answered the question, why doesn't Thomas the Tank Engine enter the atomic age? Well, if the trains are going to turn water into steam using nuclear energy, then use that nuclear energy for electricity for propulsion, then why not use the existing electric trains and use nuclear power plants to provide them with electricity? The trains then themselves wouldn't need to carry the power plant around with them and be comparative lighter. And let's drill down on that. While a nuclear engine would be the same as a steam engine requiring fuel and water, it would also be much heavier and require shielding to protect the reactor. And in this case, 200 tons of it. That radiation shielding made it so heavy that half the horsepower would be needed just to move the train. And given the complexity of the engine, each would have a cost that was far, far more than the standard locomotive, so no railroad wanted to buy into it especially in the case of derailment. In fact, in almost every scenario, nuclear trains were the inferior option. If you wanted to go fast, you didn't want to lug around a power supply and tons of water for your steam engine. You would just use an electric train like the Shinkansen or TGV. If you want to transport regular cargo or people on unelectrified tracks, then you could just use a diesel engine. You don't need water refueling stations along your way, and you've got plenty of horsepower to pull dozens of carriages. And if you want to carry large cargo across long distances, just use a ship or an aircraft. There isn't a railway network with a wide enough gauge because there isn't enough demand because ships work fine and are far more fuel efficient. If you want to carry large cargo across a short distance, then just diesel electrical trains or tracked vehicles also suffice. Lastly, there's also the argument about giving nuclear technology to those who don't need it. The fewer organizations that have a good reason to have nuclear fuel, the fewer chances, some of it disappearing and making its way to terrorists or minor countries that can jerry-rig it into a dirty bomb or engineer it into full nuclear weapons. You don't want your nuclear power train derailed by insurgents, leaking radioactive water all over the countryside, and then have 10,000 people get cancer from a dirty bomb, leaving the island of Sodor a nuclear wasteland. Oh, and remember that no refueling saving bonus? That's quickly gone when you figure out how much more maintenance and monitoring is necessary for a nuclear reactor to work versus a simple diesel engine. Not to mention the cost of a nuclear engineer versus a diesel mechanic. And yes, I'm talking about the fireman in this situation. So whatever happened when they took the X-12 to the railways? The project was developed by the University of Utah and several different railway firms were initially interested and General Motors was very keen in a bid to sell the parts for a prototype. Alas, the project never really evolved beyond the initial feasibility study, lacking the funding from the US government or any private ventures. In the end, the dream of an atomic choo-choo train never left the siding. Thanks for watching, and if you want to see more videos just like that, then make sure you click that subscribe button because you don't want to miss out on all this cool content that we've got coming for this channel and into the future. And let me know if you have any other ideas of some wacky machinery or other things too that could have happened in our amazing world of engineering. Hey, don't forget to try out the Opera desktop browser for free. It's got so many quality of life features that you'll never go back. Thank you again so much for watching.